Um, my uh, positions on Judas Iscariot, Mary Magdalene, and Joseph of Arimathea are a part of a larger project of identifying imitations of uh, Homeric epic and other Greek poetry in the Gospels. And uh, the methodology I use is mimesis criticism. And that means that the energy for the composition of the Gospels derives largely by rewriting the mythological script of the Greeks for Christian identity. And the major culprit that we're going to be talking about, in my view, is, and I don't mean culprit negatively, is um, the author of the Gospel of Mark. Mm -hmm. In each of the cases we're talking about, Mark is the first reference to these characters. And each character has a sobriquet, which is suspiciously significant. So Judas Iscariot is, let's start there. Nobody prior to um, Judas has ever been called Iscariot. It probably comes from the Greek um, preposition, is, into, and Kyrioth, which is a name of uh, a village and the word for a village. And his Homeric antecedent is Melanthius, whose job it is to drive goats from the farm into the city to support the meals of the suitors. And if there is a prime villain in the end of the Odyssey, it's Melanthius. And if there's a prime villain in the Gospel of Mark, it's um, Judas Iscariot. Mary Magdalene has a suspicious name insofar as the mother of uh, Jesus already in the Gospel of Mark is Mary. And it's two Marys and a woman named Salome who are wi witnessing the crucifixion. And Salome is a name that already in Judaism was identified with uh, sexuality. And I think her Homeric background is Helen of Troy. A Magdal um, is a word for a tower. And Mary Magdalene means Mary of the tower, in my view. And her um, a mythological background is Andromache, who watches her husband Hector dra uh, dragged behind a chariot from the Porgos or the Tower of Troy. And um, the third character is Joseph. Of course, in the tradition, J Jesus's father's name is Joseph. But it's not Joseph of Nazareth who is responsible for seeing to the uh, uh, the burial and rescue of the corpse, as it would be in the um, Iliad, for example, with Priam getting the, the, the corpse of Hector. But it's um, another Joseph from Arimathea. Now, by the way, nobody prior to Mary Magdalene was ever called a Magdalene, either male or female. So that is a neologism as far as we know, and is potentially significant. The same is true of Arimathea. Oh, it's the same through of uh, Iscariot. Nobody was known as Iscariot before Mark. Nobody was known to be from Arimathea. In fact, that is a conjured up place name. And in Greek, it probably um, means excellent discipleship. Ari is an Aristos and Mathete, uh, Mathaya uh, as uh, education. So he is the excellent disciple. Now, another reason for being suspicious of these characters is they're in, important for uh, the infant, the uh, passion narrative in Mark. Paul is obsessed with Jesus the crucified, but he never mentions a Judas Iscariot. He never mentions a Mary Magdalene. He never mentions a Joseph of Arimathea. And in fact, when he talks about people who were witnesses of the risen Jesus, he excludes, or at least doesn't say anything about Mary Magdalene. Now that silence is all, is very interesting. And the other piece, and this is important, 
in my view. Every reference to these characters in subsequent literature is derivative from Mark. And this is probably one place where Joanna is going to have some different opinions that she would, she might say the gospel of Mary or, or other texts. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but um, <laughs> one of the art, no, but one of the arguments against this position is that some of the later references to these characters um, represent independent tradition and I don't buy any of it. Now okay. that doesn't mean that these characters are not fascinating. In fact, if we take a look at Christian Apocrypha, they all have very vibrant Nachleben um, uh, afterlives. Um, there's a huge literature on um, Judas. There's a huge literature on Mary Magdalene, and this seems to be one of Joanna's special interests and, and, uh, and capacities. And there's a huge apocryphal literature on Joseph of Arimathea. So these are characters who are, in my view, mythologically created by the author of the Gospel of Mark, but have exciting and important mythological uh, afterlives. So, Joanna, that's basically um, uh, how I would view um, these characters. Thank you, Dennis. That was very interesting. And I would just like to mention right at the beginning that I want to narrow down this discussion to Mary Magdalene, because this is the area of my subject and not uh, Judas and uh, my research and not Judas and, and Joseph of Arimathea. So let's just focus on Mary Magdalene, especially that you already had shows, you know, on, on three of them. And I see your point, you know, because, uh, you know, Homer and the Iliad especially, but also the Odyssey are very important works. And, you know, the Odyssey is my most favorite, actually, not the Iliad, you know, it's most favorite, still my yeah. most favorite work of literature. My, to mine too, mine too. <laughs> So we agree. In on fact, this. in fact, the car that I bought is an odyssey for that very reason. <laughs> Fantastic. But, you know, I, I'll give you my point of view and I think I'm going to restructure, you know, my, my arguments that I prepared a little bit differently. Because although I do believe that your research is very important, you know, for the biblical studies and, you know, to notice that there is a kind of Homeric element in the writing of a canonical Gospels, I would say that this was uh, quite a common technique used at the time and used even nowadays, which is called intertextuality. Okay. Right. So what is intertextuality, you know, for our listeners and viewers? Intertextuality, it means using old structures, you know, or well-known structures, literary structures and references often indirectly to produce a new meaning. So just I will give some examples for, you know, from modern literature, maybe, or, you know, modern films. So, for example, The Apocalypse Now, which is Coppola's film about Vietnam, was really based on Joseph Conrad's Hearts of Darkness, except that one takes place in 19th century Africa, the other one 20th century Vietnam. Or, for example, something silly as Bridget Jones' Diaries is based really on Jane Austen's um, Pride and Prejudice. It's basically mm -hmm. a people who are in the known, so to speak, right, who know literature, would immediately know the reference to, to these works. So this is what intertextuality is, using old works of literature and giving them new meaning, most often in the indirect way. So my argument would be that indeed Mark, and I would argue with you, and maybe even other gospel uh, writers of the gospels, canonical gospels, use uh, on purpose intertextuality to give special meaning and more familiar meaning to the stories that they were retelling. That doesn't mean that the stories and the characters were not real. It means they wanted them to make them more familiar and more respectful for the Greek or Roman and uh, elite for whom they were writing. I understand writing. that, I, okay. So, so I would say that for example, when, because I listened to your other talks, excellent talks, by the way, when you were saying that, you know, Mary Magdalene is crying like Hector's wife and so on, that reference would be immediately noticed by the intellectual elite, 
right? And they would say, oh, so he's not just some Jewish rabbi who committed a cr some kind of crime and that's why he was crucified. Is actually, you know, like the story of, of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, Hector's wife, for example, right? So they would get the, they would immediately get this meaning because otherwise, why would they be interested in the story? It's some kind of, uh, you know, um, an upstart new religion, you know, they would not be interested in this. So that it had to be put in a form that was familiar for them and create, you know, a meaningful meaning for them. And in fact, I was just looking at other examples of late antiquity of using Homer as a form of intertextuality in Christian texts. And just uh, after brief research, I found, for example, Martyrdom, Martyrdom of St. Cyprian by Euelia Eudosia, who borrows and reorders structures from the Odyssey and retells the parts of a biblical narrative as if it was a story of the Odyssey. And that's why it is often called a Homeric Christian writing. Another one is Gregory of Nyssa, Life of Macrina, fourth century work, when she does the same, basically. She uses Homer to justify, you know, to give certain gravitas, you know, to the story. You know, it's not just some poor saint, you know, it is like the story of Odysseus or it is like the story of Hector. And my personal, you know, big favorite because I was, uh, my master's and honors was based on St. Augustine of Hippo, fourth century um, uh, saint uh, from Carthage and Rome. Uh, his seminal work is Magnus Opus, uh, um, uh, Opus Magnum, uh, the city of uh, God. He is extensively using, which he talks about the fall of Rome, by the way, which fell in 410. He's extensively using as an intertextuality Virgil's NA8, but yeah. also Homer, whom he actually doesn't respect because his Greek wasn't so good. So that's why he was minimizing. However, scholars found, despite his dislike of Homer, 11 intertextual references to Homer in the city of God. Yeah. So Homer was extensively used. And then another work, which I actually, this is how I was learning my Latin by reading Confessions by St. Augustine. I had to get a tutor. Uh, so, for example, when he was writing Confessions, he was using not Homer, but another, you know, great works of uh, that were common in, in, and well known in, in, in Rome at the time, like Petronius Satirica and Ovid's Metamorphosis. So he used the structures of his work. So people who are uh, uh, in the known, the intellectual elite would treat his Confessions, which is his spiritual autobiography as a Christian, you know, with the same respect. So these are just some examples of intertextuality, of Homeric intertextuality. So I would argue that I absolutely agree with you what Mark did, however, that he did it on purpose. So if you don't mind, can I continue or uh, with well, it? Let me respond to it if I might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderful treatment of <laughs> intertextuality in the patristic period. And one could add um, in the city of God, how many quotations we have from Plato um, and the philosophers. And um, he was a polymath of the first order. And one of the projects that he has in the city of God is to talk about the permanence of God's kingdom as opposed to what's happening in Rome and around him uh, with uh, the fall of the city. And uh, what he's got is a major project of uh, social re-identification and uh, uses literature as a way of redefining um, what the uh, Christian uh, community can expect in the future. So I thought what you, you said is right on target and, um, and actually could be expanded. I'm a big fan of Evdosia and the Homero Gentonis myself, and there are other examples one could give, but what you've done is really helpful to um, help uh, people who are not authorities in this period to understand that mimesis and intertextuality was a game that intellectuals played in order to support the evolving social identities of themselves and their readers. Um, and so, um, and I can, I, I'm going to anticipate where I think you're going with this. It doesn't mean that those characters didn't exist. 
it means that the mythological and literary uh, antecedents were there and available and culturally registered in such a manner as to enhance them, uh, their, their reputations. So uh, yeah, I think in the discussion, it's not going to be an either or. It's mm -hmm. going to be how much um, intertextuality or mimesis, I would call it, um, is, or put another way, literary judgments are not historical judgments. But the literary judgments and historical judgments can be related to each other. And I think that maybe is probably, I wouldn't be surprised that we're going to have to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so thank you for this. And so I think we can agree that, you know, Mark probably did it, except that I have a different interpretation of why he did it, right? So when. Okay, we, okay, we, that's fine. So that's fair enough. And now I would like to look at maybe other examples of intertextuality in the in, in, in the scriptures or in the Bible that perhaps are not Homeric, you know, just to show that they were also using it. And that relates to Mary sure. Magdalene, because I just want to focus on her, not, not on Judas. That's just fine. That's fine. That's fine. So, for example, uh, Song of Songs. So, uh, the... Uh, whether it is Rufinus of Aquileia or Gregory the Great, they point out immediately that, you know, the, 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 the scenes with Mary Magdalene, right, at the moment of resurrection when she's lamenting her beloved's death is basically taken from songs 3-1. So they both made a re reference to this. Then a little bit more friendly towards Mary Magdalene, an argument that Margaret Starbert was using, which is the book of Micah, or Micah, I'm not sure how you pronounce it in English, chapter 4-8, where, you know, there's this reference to the tower, as for you, as, as for you, O Mary Magdalene, the watch over of the flock, a stronghold of the daughter of Zion, right? So she's referring here to the tower of Zion, or Magdalene, right? So, so it's the book of Micah or Micah, chapter 4.a. So this is another reference to the tower. Now, uh, John 20 is reusing 2 Kings 2.1, where Elisha witnesses Elijah's ascent or Elijah's ascent, and similarly, two kings too, where Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him and the four Israelites obeyed him as well in Numbers 27, 16. And this is where, for example, uh, some scholars are arguing for this intertextuality, which is there present as well. That's why there is a prominence of Mary Magdalene. It was intertextuality to show how important she actually was in the story because she witnessed, you know, the ascension of Jesus the way that Elisha witnessed Elijah's ascent. And the same way that, you know, when Moses laid his hand, hands on, on Joshua, then this is the way when, you know, uh, there's the last scene between Mary Magdalene and, and, uh, and Jesus at the moment of, you know, uh, when, when she sees him resurrected. So these are very important uh, also elements of intellectuality that actually elevate Mary, the importance of Mary Magdalene in the story, which are not only mythical, but also biblical, which what in Christian tradition would be called Old Testament. And uh, I would just like to all add one more thing that um, on intertextuality that Professor Robin uh, Faith Walsh in her quite recent book, and I think she was interviewed by Jacob here a few yes. times, uh, Mm -hmm. she, she says that uh, she also talks about intertextuality, intertextuality in, the, in, in the synoptic gospels, but she said that they're actually in a constant dialogue with each other and borrow from each other. And she sees other, in ch especially in chapters two and four, examples of intertextuality that refer to Plato, you know, and the reference of spirit, especially in Mark. So it would suggest to me that Mark was actually an, in, you know, well-educated man who was using different forms of intertextuality to elevate the position of, you know, of Jesus and Mary Magdalene in, in this in, in this respect, right? And also, as I said, there's other examples from um, also for, from John 20 and so on that refer to what Christians call the Old Testament, you know, to elevate actually the position of Mary Magdalene as the one who is actually inheriting the, the spirit, so to speak, of the teachings of Jesus. Uh, okay, I don't uh, deny that you have intertextuality with Jewish texts. 
at all. And in fact, many readers of my work have accused me of almost being anti-Semitic or anti-biblical uh, allusions. And that's really not fair. And mm -hmm. in fact, um, in the synopsis that I'm working on and that should be published in the few months, um, I make sure that the biblical allusions are cited. So I don't, uh, I don't deny that you have that kind of intertextuality going on as well. Here's um, a question that um, I think we're probably going to differ on, but I think is really important, Joanna, for this discussion. Mm -hmm. Do you think that what Mark was doing um, was positive about Mary Magdalene or negative? Oh, I would think that's absolutely positive. I would think so positive in the context of their own times. Okay, so I just want to maybe sh should move in this this other argument. Why is it in the context of the times? Because and actually I didn't address one other point that you were saying because you were referring also to Paul. So I don't want to forget Paul, right? So before we move to intertextuality, I want to address Paul because I made a note when you were so talking about it. So I don't think. And this is where we are starting to disagree, <laughs> which is good, right? This is what a good academic no, it's fine. You know, we're talking. Vigorous discussion is. So, for example, you say, oh, he doesn't mention her. But my response to it, which is, you know, I respond with a certain attitude, you know, so please take in <laughs> this into, in, in this, uh, keep it in mind. So we have to remember that as far as we know, I mean, who is Paul? Paul had the experience on the way to Damascus, and I really, you know, honor this experience because, you know, Holy Spirit entered him or in the Hindu tradition it's called, you know, like he, sh he had a Shakti path or, you know, he had a Holy Spirit entering him and this is how he met Jesus in spirit. But he never really claimed, I would argue, or nobody really claimed that Paul actually met Jesus in person. So I would say he is not really a kind of uh, legitimate character to discuss who is historical and who is not historical because he never met Jesus, he never met Mary Magdalene. You know, he just had a spiritual experience and he started to teach. Fair enough. Next one is that, you know, we all know what Paul said in Corinthians 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. So I say that even if he met Mary Magdalene, which he didn't because he didn't meet Jesus either, he would not be very friendly towards her because what he says is very clear what he meant about women speaking up generally. And as we know, if we have the time and we discuss the apocryphal scriptures as well, and maybe some other parts of the scriptures, you know, Mary Magdalene was perceived as someone who was a disciple of Jesus. Okay, let me, let me respond to those if you will. Yeah. Yes. First of all, that passage in Paul is widely contested as not being Pauline. And I'm one of the believers who said, who uh, insists that that was a later addition. And it shows the influence of the pastoral epistles. But what do you do, honestly, with 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is trying to make a historical argument that Jesus appeared to the twelve and to, um, uh, to, to James and Peter and, and these other people? That is allegedly a historical claim. And uh, why does he, uh, is it just that he's a sexist that he doesn't want to mention Mary? Um, he mentions other people who saw, I mean, that that's, seems to me on the face of it to be an attempt to um, get credibility uh, from eyewitnesses. I, I don't think it's historical. I don't think it's right. But I think that uh, it, I can't imagine that um, had he known of a tradition about Mary Magdalene, he wouldn't have included her. That would have been um, helpful. I'm not so sure if it wouldn't be so helpful, even if, you know, you're correct, because I agree that some people dispute this particular fragment, which, which whether it was really Pauline or not. However, it is still being used, you know, uh, against women, you know, especially in the past. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. So, so uh, but yes, uh, uh, fair enough. You know, it may or may not be Paul's. However, I don't think, I will tell you maybe why Paul would not use Mary Magdalene or maybe 
other women, simply because I would like to refer to my other argument when we talk about Mary Magdalene here, it is about uh, the concept of knowledge and power and who is controlling it. And here I would like to refer to French scholar Michel Foucault, who said that uh, uh, knowledge is used to advance the interest and power of certain groups while marginalizing others. This often legitimizes the mistreatment of this in the name of, a, uh, of correcting and helping them. So, for example, the question is basically is who controls knowledge? And in those times, I think we can, can agree that women and men are definitely not equal. And, you know, this saying, whether it was Pauline or not, it probably represented the view of the majority of people. So a woman like, for example, Mary Magdalene would not be noticed and would be omitted. So that's why I would like to say that the fact that she was not in many cases, and let me check my notes, Mary Magdalene was mentioned 12 times in the Bibles, in the Bible, which is more than Matthew and Mark taken together. Nine times she's mentioned first, right? And very important, you know, uh, in Mark, you know, 14, 9, truly I tell you, where, uh, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her, which is actually amazing, I would say, amazing that anyone in those times elevated a woman, you know, associated with great religious figure to, to, to this level especially that knowledge was created, you know, and was uh, and not created, but was controlled and it continues to be controlled. Like, for example, okay, I, 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 okay I, I have to respond to that. The name I, I means renowned, 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 renowned far and wide. And uh, she um, showed great hospitality and has fame because she showed hospitality to Odysseus and recognized him from his scar. So the idea that Mary has um, renown far and wide is a part of the mimetic mythology. Now, uh, I, but I really want to press my point. Mm -hmm. I think Mark's attitude toward the women is negative. And um, crucial to that is going to be your decision about this. What, mm -hmm. at, at what verse does the gospel of Mark break off? Is it verse 20 or is it verse eight? I cannot say from memory. I don't have the, the Bible in front of me. So what, what, what do you well, refer to? The, last, the, the earliest version of the Gospel of Mark says, mm -hmm. the women told nobody because they were afraid. And then you have the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark that has them telling and so on. Now, what's at stake in the Gospel of Mark? The women did not tell. What did they not tell? They were told by the young man in the tomb to go to, ne to Galilee. They would see Jesus there. They don't tell anybody. So what that means is the church stayed in Jerusalem and it suffered in the Jewish war. And that Mark is blaming the women, not Jesus and not the young man in the tomb. He's blaming women for the silence that caused the carnage in Jerusalem. And the later tradition tried to uh, patch up the problem. But um, the problem in Mark is uh, is there. Now, of course, there are lots of interpretations of the longer ending. I mean, of the, of the shorter end or the, the ending of Mark. Um, it was a corrupt, uh, maybe there was something more that happened. Or maybe in a, in a modern term, um, the reader is to assume the women finally did tell. But after all, they were the ones who were given this information and not to the disciples. Mm. But I think Mark's attitude toward Mary Magdalene and the other women is primarily negative. Well, I first of all, first of all, I would disagree with this, but of course it is open for interpretation. But I would like to finish my argument also about the uh, knowledge and power, which was control, right? And, and we know that, for example, even the synoptic gospels were rewritten several times and even before the Council of Nicaea in 325. So, for example, in the, before the Nicaea, the Gnostic documents were considered as canonical in many Syrian churches. And even in the Roman church, the Apocalypse of Peter was considered canonical and the Muratori Canon, which is the oldest known list of most books of the New Testament, uh, had... Uh, 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 the Apocalypse of Peter in it, which is a Gnostic document, and which was later excluded from, from the canon. I, I'm so sorry, Joanna. Are, Jacob, are we cutting off somehow with the sound? I didn't hear that last. I heard everything she said. 
Okay, I didn't. I'm Should sorry. I repeat that? Or? Would Should you? I yeah. Okay. Please. So I think, so my argument is again about knowledge and power and that it was controlled. And we know also that synoptic gospels were also rewritten several times and different books were added or removed from them. And my example here is that, for example, many Gnostic gospel, gospels and documents were included in the Syrian churches until the Council of Nicaea. Even in the Roman Catholic Church, certain Gnostic documents were considered canonical as they are listed in the Muratori Canon, which is the oldest known list most of the books of the New Testament. So we know that it was always going on. Now with the attitude towards women, because I want to say something, that the example of Mary Magdalene as somebody who was a disciple, and we haven't discussed yet the Gnostic documents and you know where she was mentioned, was a great example for women preachers in the first and second century, which were present there, which were allowed in the so-called Gnostic or alternative communities, but were looked down upon and criticized by the Orthodox community. So can I give you a few examples, such as, for example, Marcelina, Carpocratian leader, and Dr. Uh, David Litwa wrote a wonderful book of her about her recently. And then there in the Montanist had two preachers, Maximila and Prisca. Other women like Helena, Filomena, Flora, uh, were also teachers and disciples involved in alternative Christian sects, which were later, you know, uh, dispelled as not uh, as not orthodox. And although, you know, and also some Valentinian groups had female teachers, although I do not remember them by name. However, um, orthodox, orthodox, so let's see, never mind Mark, but orthodox, also orthodox, um, um, theologians or historians like Irenaeus against the heretics, right? He said that, you know, he called them, that they led multitudes astray, especially, Ma Ma uh, especially Marcelina. Or for example, even worse, Tertullian, second century, the church father, he called them the immodest vipers, you know, and so on. So although women were allowed, you know, in this alternative, uh, uh, groups, they were not, they were always criticized by the orthodox groups, right? So women were always, uh, women who took Mary Magdalene, I believe, you know, as an example for a preacher, well, in the orthodox tradition were basically silenced, right? And then only later on this tradition took over in, in, in other countries, especially, you know, there's a long, tra long, long standing tradition in southern France and so on of Mary Magdalene being ev evangelized of southern France. So, um, so what I am saying here, that this knowledge was always controlled. So Mark, whether he was positive or negative towards women, it depends on the versions, you know, that you look. However, he does give her prominence, you know, he does give her prominence. Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in the, even in the canonical gospels, and we don't discuss ap apocrypha yet. And the fact, my argument is the fact that she was so prominent one way or another in times when women are not allowed anything really, especially in the Orthodox tradition, is uh, actually uh, a, a wonderful possibility that she was an important part of the story historically and mythically and theologically. Uh, okay, I would... Um... Uh, I appreciate much of what you said, Joanna, and I would agree with uh, the bulk of it. Mm -hmm. Several times you used the word that always the Orthodox were dumping on Mary Magdalene or women's authority, and that's not true. Um, we have examples of that. There are exceptions, but I think generally your pat the pattern is correct. I also would be the last person to deny the importance of um, yeah, the lamentable importance of uh, sexism and uh, patriarchy in the, the Christian tradition. And I've written actually rather extensively about it in several ways. Um, and you have women's agency uh, advocated among the Orthodox, but even more so, you're right, in marginal communities. So I don't, I really don't want to challenge what you said, just to say that it, it as you know, is messy. And by the way, one of the things that must have been fun for you in your research is there are some really wonderful studies 
that are uh, about this, you know, Tertullian on women and Augustine, mm. uh, uh, Augustine on women and yeah. uh, so on. So it's pretty miserable stuff. Uh, and one of the worst ones, I think, are the Cappadocian fathers that we get a, 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 and things get really, really messy there. So I don't deny that. One of the things that's fascinating, and I, I do have more to say, but I want to make sure that I mention this. Mm -hmm. You didn't say anything about Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John, which, of course, is one of the, uh, at the end of John and the appearance of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. Uh, and that's one of the really seminal uh, episodes in um, her Nachleben, in her reception. Um, do you have anything you'd want to add that's related to... Uh, I just mentioned her in John 20 that he's reusing kings too, you know, when I was talking about intertextuality. Yes, you did. You did do yeah. that, yeah. Yes, and so so this is what's important. And also, I I, I have a list here of, um, you know, where she was mentioned and when she was mentioned first, but I didn't want to just go through, you know, all the sayings about Mary Magdalene. But of course, she's very important in John 20, you know, and I think this is where her pr primary importance actually comes, right? For me. I think that's right. I think that is yeah. correct. Yes, yeah. but because we were focusing, I thought we were focusing mostly on Mark, so I just focused on intertextuality in John, you know, and why he wanted to elevate her by making this kind of comparison, you know, uh, which is but Joanna, for me, for mm -hmm. me, the difference between Mark and John is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that I, th I really do think Mark treats these women badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's not a fan of Mary Magdalene and he's not giving her authority. He's de denying them the authority they were given. But in the Johannine gospel, she's given remarkable authority. And in fact, the insertion of the apostolic foot race, I call it, between the beloved disciple and uh, Peter uh, interrupts all of that so that she's kind of left standing at the tomb. Yeah. And yeah. these male disciples are the ones that get the credit for uh, getting into the tomb and, and whatever. But she nonetheless is the first person to observe the risen Jesus. And that's probably a part of that's the earliest version, probably in the Gospel of John. So there, I think you really do have an affirmation of women's agency. Yeah. Um, I think the intertext there most likely is Euripides Bacchae and um, Pent Pentheus talking to his mother before he dies. But um, I, that, we don't want to get there. Uh, we don't, I don't think we want to go there. That's pretty complex. But I think um, what you said about the denial of women's agency in the Orthodox tradition is important, and I agree with it. I think it's messier, it's not so absolute, but I, I do think that that is, um, is dominant and you can see the implications of that in organized religion even today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this admission. And also, I was thinking that perhaps we can move towards Apocrypha as well, right? Because I know that in one of his talk your talks, you were saying that uh, something about the Q Gospel. And I think there is a good, uh, good go argument that uh, perhaps uh, uh, the Gospel of Thomas could be a Q uh, Gospel. And there, Mary Magdalene is also mentioned in the last saying, the saying 114. Right, so uh, in a just maybe a quote, I'm saying one fourteen from Gospel of Peter Thomas. says, "Women are not worthy of life." <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then because Jesus says, "I'm going to make uh, her male." Uh, yeah, so that's denying and women agency. So that she too may become a living spirit, right? And that's so right. Yeah. She's mentioned there, and I know when we start talking about apocrypha, which I actually really am interested in, and I'm probably you're not so interested in this. It is because oh, usually, yeah, you are fantastic, mm. because I really love Gospel of um, of Thomas simply because it is probably the earliest of the of the so-called Gnostic gospels. So there is a pretty good argument that it could be or is very close to the Q gospel for several reasons. One of them, that it just gives simple sayings of Jesus, the teacher. It doesn't make him into apocalyptic, which is probably what the Q gospel would be. Doesn't pile up any titles on him as a savior, messiah or anything. He's just a, 
you know, a teacher who gives teachings. And also he's not an apocalyptic teacher because uh, there at all, he doesn't mention this there at all, which some, uh, some scholars argue that it means it was written before the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. Also, some you know quite uh, <laughs> legitimate scholars, very legitimate scholars like Elaine uh, Pagels, they argue that actually Mark and and and, and uh, yes, she said Mark and Luke were actually written in response to to Thomas. So uh, and there, you know, just going back to Mary Magdalene and her and her prominence, and then Mary Magdalene is mentioned. So even you know, Gospel of of Thomas. So would you like to respond to this before I move to other? Well, words? I think that that stemma of relationships is is really fundamentally flawed. Ah, and, wow. um, uh, what? Sorry. Okay. Because we have evidence in the Gospel of Thomas of redaction of the Gospels. Uh, this has been shown by Bart Ehrman and others. So the author of the Gospel of Thomas knows the Synoptic Gospels and maybe knows John. And so uh, the direction of dependence cannot go from Thomas to the Synoptics unless you're going to do some pretty clever uh, textual rewriting. So um, that would be I, one place that I would really insist on Mark's primacy. And that's the first time we have Mary Magdalene, and she is not treated well. She's not treated well, but we are talking about knowledge and power, right? So obviously she's not treated well, but she is there. And we are not arguing here whether she was treated well or not, but whether she existed, right? And they do refer to her. And what you said about the Gospel of Thomas, what you say is true, but also there are other arguments. And you know that, uh, you know, the arguments go back and forth about it, you know, which one was the first. And when we talk about the Gnostic Gospels, this was probably, you know, the earliest and, and probably written at the same, that same time, if not earlier, than some of the Synoptic Gospels. Well, when I say that I'm interested in Apocrypha, I really am. And actually, I was a, an authority in my earlier years mm -hmm. on Apocryphal Acts of Apostles. And there you clearly have women's agency. The Thecla story, then uh, Maximilla in the Acts of Andrew. You have um, several women who are strong uh, agents and uh, actually vehicles of revelation in the Acts of Thomas. Um, the, um, so the apocryphal Acts tradition really is involved in women's agency and empowerment. Mm -hmm. So. Um, some of them are in from marginal uh, communities, but uh, cakes could be made that actually some of them are also Orthodox. Um, so I think this this is an example of the um, the contested role of women's agency in these texts. And I'm so glad you're looking at the Apocrypha. <laughs> Unfortunately, people often ignore it. Yes. Yes, and you know, I think it's interesting because uh, people often, uh, you know, obsessed about dating, which is also, you know, nobody really agrees about the dating there. But I think that this uh, apocryphal gospels address certain issues that maybe, you know, were uh, diminished, you know, in the synoptic gospels. So as you know, just uh, let me say it just for the sake of the argument and because I love it, when we talk, for example, about the gospel of Mary Magdalene, you know, uh, she's there portrayed as a disciple of Jesus, you know, after the crucifixion, the disciples come to her and, you know, ask her for, you know, for a teaching. And in all of this, in all of this uh, uh, gospels, but especially in the gospel of Mary Magdalene, there is a, a quite a obvious conflict between Mary Magdalene and Peter and Peter objecting to, to her actually being there, just like in the in the Gospel of Thomas. So I think that, you know, yeah. there's a pretty also good argument here that this early Christian communities were kind of responding in dialogue, you know, with each other. That's right. you know, like, Absolutely. Like they're saying, why Peter has primacy, you know, we have here Mary Magdalene, <laughs> right? And he actually didn't want, uh, you know, he, he's consistently going against her. And, and Jesus consistently kind of takes her side. The same, for example, as in, in, in the Gospel of P Philip, right? When, which, you know, she's called the Koinoinos, right? Or the partner, and, you know, why do you love her more than us? Or in Pistis Sophia, which, you know, she asked 39 out of 42 questions, I think, if I'm correct, you know, of Jesus, and Jesus responds to her. And Peter yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and then Peter get upset again, and then Jesus tell him, oh, Peter, you know, give me a break, right? Like, let's, let her speak. Okay, I want, so, I, 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 
Uh, I want to uh, say something I'm sure you don't know, that in my mm -hmm. reconstruction of Q, I place the Pericope Adulteri, the mm -hmm. origin of the story of Jesus forgiving a sinful woman appeared in the Q document. And mm -hmm. the authors of the Gospels knew that story and they expunged it because Jesus is forgiving a, a woman who um, w was uh, promiscuous. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think already in the Q document, you have uh, some contestation about gender. Mm -hmm. and uh, in the reception of that story. And in fact, um, Jennifer Kunst and um, um, uh, Wasserman, Tony Va Tommy Wasserman, have done a wonderful job in uh, tracing the history of that, uh, that pericope. And they throw up their hands about the origins of it. But I think a case can be, a strong case can be made that it was in Q. Mm -hmm. So I would say that is early. And by the way, of course, gender is contested already in the Pauline epistles. So I don't think this issue of um, uh, gender contestation uh, was new and came up with apocryphal texts. I think it was there probably at the beginning. Mm, quite possibly, but it's more prominent, maybe, you know, it's very prominent, right? That's because fair enough, they, that's fair enough, yeah. Yeah, put, put, put her very often in forefront, you know, and they kind of start this discussion between when Peter, you know, why Peter is prominent, maybe he is not so prominent, right? Why Rome has to be prominent. And we know that early church, you know, uh, it was not, it, it was a big argument between different uh, ecclesiastical seats, you know, why Rome, why not Constant Constantinople or why not uh, Alexandria, right? Alexandria of course, was quite, of course, yeah. right? So, so it was also associated with kind of political movements like that, right? Uh, Jacob, do you have a, a question for us or a comment? Not so far. I'm just listening to you uh, to you both discourse. <laughs> I and I just perhaps I'll just uh, throw something up for discussion here because I know in one of your other debates you mentioned something that you know we should uh, uh, some kind of separate history from the story, but I, I don't think that we actually can do this. You know because uh, the history and the story are very closely connected with each other. Right. And then I think that the theology or the mythology, you know, associated with spiritual belief is somehow historically grounded. And then, for example, in the case of Mary Magdalene, we also have, you know, this, this story continues. Let's say it didn't stop with the female preachers in the first and second century that later disappeared. There must be something to the story, I would say, that it continued later also, so in a very dominant way in, in some cultures, for example, in southern France, you know, which the earliest source comes from the eighth century, right? And, and, and then it's again repeated in the first century. There is a huge community in Provence, you know, we're talking about the evangelization of, uh, of southern France by Marie Magdalene. We have in 13th century actually we have a Cathar tradition in the west, southern uh, west, west, yeah, on the western side of, of France, uh, which also, you know, uh, had women preachers, and they also took example from Mary Magdalene. And we but, know but Joanna, you you know surely mm. that the mythologizing happens with characters who are historical and not historical. So the, the fact that you have Mary Magdalene and the Theotokos and other women who are important in later tradition doesn't mm -hmm. mean they existed. It means that those mythologies were very powerful. Let me be uh, come back at, at a different way. Mm -hmm. I get caught in the middle between mythicists and fundamentalists. Mm. Mythicists say, okay, Dennis, you've shown how much intertextuality or mimesis there is in the Gospels. Why do you still think that there's a historical Jesus? And my answer is really quite simple. It's because mythology doesn't, or mimesis doesn't explain everything. And that's why the Q document is important. That's why Paul's important. That's why if you simply can't say that Jesus is mythological. Jesus was a character who was ripe for mythologizing, but it doesn't mean there wasn't a historical Jesus. On the other hand, there are characters whose um, historical credibility and existence is questionable. 
And the more that one can say about the significance of their names and their roles and their antecedents, the less likely it is that they are historical. Now, I don't know if, I honestly do not know if there was a Judas or Mary Magdalene or Joseph of Arimathea. For me, it doesn't matter much, honestly. What I can say is they have significant roles in the narratives. They have suspicious names. And I see no reason to think that Mark inherited that, but he created it in order to make this fascinating um, legacy. And everything about Mary Magdalene and these characters, as far as I can tell, spins out of that. But it spins out of that with dynamos, uh, with uh, um, dynamically, and with uh, polyvalence and power and imagination. I love those traditions you're talking <laughs> about. And you didn't mention, you know, uh, Compostela and, uh, uh, you, you know, and the uh, the James tradition and uh, and so on. Um, you know, Jesus' twin brother. Do you just have a twin brother? Oh, come on. So um, the issue of history, this is why I said in my opening remarks that I think mm -hmm. the issue of whether mythology requires one to give up a historical quest is a vexed one, because mm -hmm. sometimes historical characters like Alexander the Great have a huge legacy and important literature afterwards. There are other people like um, Heracles, who never existed, who also have a vital mythological history. So the question then is, what criteria are we going to use to determine whether we have a historical character mythologized or a, uh, a mimical, uh, you know, an imitated character mythologized? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, um, I have my own criteria. You probably do, too. Um, and I think that's where the, the, the rub comes. Um, let me put it another way, and I'm not accusing you of your uh, uh, saying anything about your religious background. I'm talking about the responses I've gotten to my work. I actually quite respect people who take a look honestly at my work and end up by saying, just because you have a character mythologized doesn't mean that character didn't exist. I agree with that. And I actually agree that that's the case with Jesus. But I don't think it needs to be the case with everyone. So then what makes the case for Jesus different from the other ones? And I'm willing to talk about it, but th that may be a different broadcast. But the, uh, the fact that you have put your finger on the pulse of the exciting mythologies of uh, Mary Magdalene is wonderful. And uh, as I said, I've enjoyed reading the, the stories about the evolution of women's empowerment in the Christian tradition. Um, and I, I hope you can make the contribution you, uh, you want to make in that, Joanna. Thank you, Dennis. But I would, and you know, and thank you for this. But I also would like to say that you know that's true. You say this is very vexing, like which character is mythological and which one is historical. So I come back here, you know, uh, and it is a different podcast. So let's not go to this. You know, when I would argue that you know if the whole story is important, you cannot remove Mary Magdalene or Joseph of Amarathia for this reason, or Judas, and make the story important again. You know, you cannot just say that one character of the story is important and the rest is not important. Because frankly, if we talk about narratives of resurrection, and I wrote about it in my book, The Other Goddess, the narratives of resurrection and resurrected young kings and gods you know, is, is, is as ancient as, as human history. So uh, Jesus is not the first character that got resurrected, right? So, so what makes absolutely no, no, yeah. What and makes I'm even, not saying even I'm not saying that these mythologies are not important. Yeah, so so there are there are you know other other kind of mythologies about resurrection of of a young king or a young man yeah. or a young god. So absolutely. I mean, like these stories are as ancient and as, as, as human history, so to speak, as human consciousness. And I think they teach us something really important. And uh, and uh, you know, yes 
scholarships is your scholarship is impeccable however i would like to argue that the that you cannot argue again by one person of the story is historical and the others are not because it basically disintegrates the story which is older than jesus story itself yeah i would disagree with that but anyway that <laughs> okay another but it's a different podcast then yes because when you talk about jesus but this is you know in my book the other goddess i actually look you know into the stories of resurrection you know and the role of women in this and also you know the young god you know and it, it is an it, in all cultures, but, in but, all cultures, you have it. And Joseph I Campbell. I agree with that. I agree. I, okay, I agree, agree with that. Yeah. But then you have the same problem with Socrates. Um, you know, uh, should we not worry about who Socrates was? And, you know, how do we compare Aristophanes and uh, Zen Xenophon and Plato mm -hmm. and get a, a, a better pick and other, uh, and the Stoics, um, get a better picture of Socrates? So it's one thing to say that the picture of Socrates is powerful and important, and one needs to hear the whole story. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that historical investigations into a historical Socrates are meaningless. They may not be as interesting, and I think they probably would be as interesting. And it certainly is difficult, but uh, I wouldn't want to abandon the task for so a historical Socrates or a historical Jesus myself. Okay, but I would, on the other hand, argue that we cannot prove history, we can only interpret it, right? And we can only put it in, in its particular context. And I think that especially, I would just like to maybe end on here on, on, on Mary Magdalene again, that Mary, you know, nobody really cares apart from the integrity of the story, you know, for Judas or, or for Joseph or Matthia. You know, when Mary Magdalene, for many women, especially in modern times, is probably the last string that actually attaches them to Christianity, right? So I wonder, you know, we have to also think about the consequences of our research, which is basically, this is how I'm just saying here as a, as a feminist researcher here. So for, for centuries, Mary Magdalene, you know, was vilified in many ways. Her, her role was diminished, you know, she was called a prostitute and so on. And now we're actually trying to prove that she didn't exist. So what good does it do actually, right? Especially that nothing in this case can be proved either for or against. And, and, it, and, and, and also it interferes with the integrity of the whole story which is of great spiritual okay. importance. Well, I would like to thank you both for joining me today. This is a very fascinating uh, discussion, and very fascinating to listen to both of you talk and uh, hear these arguments, which was respectful, it was great, it was cordial, and I really enjoyed it. And I thank you both for coming on today once again. Now I enjoyed it too, Joanna. Uh, all the best. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you for your scholarship. I, I hope you publish your papers also on, on, on intertextuality and, and, and Homer in, in, in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll happen. Thank you. It will happen. Thank you so much. Great pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Take care. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.